Namaste and good afternoon. Greetings from all of us at Apollo Hospitals. This is Dr. Srinidhi Chidambaram and I'm very happy to see all of you again. I hope you've been well and safe and in the best of health. Sometimes a major health condition begins with the mildest of symptoms. But when you are not aware of what your symptoms could indicate, you end up delaying seeking immediate medical attention and this often leads to worsening of the disease and severe outcomes. That is why we at Apollo Hospitals have been regularly hosting these Facebook live sessions to give you factual information straight from our experts so that you can be fine-tuned to your body and to your symptoms and not ignore early warning signs. All through this month, we have been discussing a disease where every minute counts and the longer it goes untreated, the greater the potential for damage and disability. Yes, it's stroke, the condition where the blood supply to a part of your brain is interrupted or reduced. The brain tissue is very sensitive. It needs a constant supply of blood to deliver oxygen to the thousands of nerve cells that power thought and function. If the blood supply to the brain is disrupted even briefly, large numbers of brain cells can die within minutes. Acute stroke damages the brain, but the long-term effects really depend on how quickly acute stroke is recognized and treated and how it is treated, which parts of the brain are affected and many other factors. To talk about this very crucial topic in depth, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Srinivasan Paramasivam, Senior Consultant, Neurosurgeon, Head of Neuroendovascular Surgery at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. Dr. Paramasivam is also adjunct, adjunct Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery at Mount Sinai Hospital, New York. Uh, he completed his MBBS from the Madurai Medical College and the MD was conferred on him by the New York State Educational Department, New York. He also holds an MCH neurosurgery degree from the Madras Medical College. He's also a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and holds a fellowship in endovascular neurosurgery at the St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital, Columbia University, College of Surgeons and Physicians at New York. Dr. Parabasivam is a member of numerous medical organizations, including the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and many more. He has published a variety of peer-reviewed scholarly articles in leading journals like the Journal of Neurosurgery, Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery, Interventional Neuroradiology, and many more. has also authored and co-authored book chapters in several textbooks on various topics and served as the principal and co-investigator for many multi-center clinical trials. Dr. Srinivasan Parmasimam, welcome to our FB live session. Our viewers are eagerly waiting to hear all about acute stroke and early management. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srinidhi, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, let me straight go to the topic on acute stroke. We are all gifted with the, the wonderful organ called the brain, which is the most complex creation in the universe. And this is a creation which nobody can duplicate. And we are all gifted with it and we need to save it and preserve it uh, through our lifetime. That is extremely important. Let me tell you some facts about the brain. The brain is a very small organ, but a very active organ. It only occupies about 2% of our body weight but it consumes a lot of the oxygen that we take in every day. The amount of glucose that it uses every day, it's about say 25% of the energy that we use every day. So it is a small little active organ and it doesn't store energy. It constantly needs supply of energy and oxygen for it to function effectively. So any interruption in its blood supply, any interruption in its nutritional supply will show immediately on the patient. So that is what stroke means. The stroke is not a new term. It has been described about 2000 years ago by Hippocrates uh, saying that a sudden strike uh, in the neurologic status of an individual that comes like a bolt from the blue and the patient is incapacitated within seconds and minutes. That is what stroke means. As far as the stroke is concerned, there are basically two different types of stroke. One, we call it as a 
hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleeding inside or outside the brain. And that stroke is relatively less, which means that uh, about 20% of the people suffer from a hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke, uh, bleeding may be at the base of the brain, which may be because of an aneurysmal rupture, a bubble in the blood vessel that ruptures, or inside the brain, that is because of chronic hypertension, their blood vessels become hyalinized, they become so thick, and a sudden rush of blood into the brain can rupture the blood vessel and cause that kind of a stroke. That constitutes only about 20% of all the strokes that we see. But the majority of the stroke that we see is a ischemic stroke. Ischemic stroke is lack of blood supply to the brain. Lack of blood supply may be because the blood flow is arrested by chronic, slow, progressive narrowing of the blood vessel, or it is because of a sudden occlusion of the blood vessel. Most of the time they present because there is a sudden and uh, occlusion of the blood vessel. And as far as the uh, stroke facts are concerned, uh, certain things we need to understand before we get into the actual pattern of stroke. That is, uh, it's a very common disease and about say, like uh, in one's lifetime, I would say like one in six people that we see around us will suffer a stroke. And every second, there is like one or two people in the world suffering a stroke. And it is a th third leading cause of death all over the world. And it is a number one cause of disability. This point, I want to reiterate a lot because stroke does not make many people die, but stroke make them disabled. Disability is a far more difficult than death per se, because disability of an individual, say, if someone in our family is disabled, we need to take care of them. Their productivity is lost, their caretaker's productivity is lost, and it costs a lot of uh, practically money, energy, time, effort to take care of them. And it is a big social burden per se. And we assess an individual's disability by assessment of what we call it as a modified Rankin scale. And our goal is to put people at the lowest possible modified Rankin scale by our modern treatment so that they are more independent and they are less disabled. That is what the goal of the treatment of stroke is all about. And as, for, as I told you, the stroke is, uh, about 80% of the stroke is because of lack of blood supply, okay? That is the ischemic stroke. Not all of them are extremely severe kind of a stroke. A significant number of them are strokes like transient ischemic attacks, milder strokes involving smaller blood vessels where they present with a subtle small signs and if they are picked up in that situation and we treat them effectively, we can prevent a major stroke happening much later in their life, okay? And as far as the causes of strokes are concerned, there are many causes of strokes, okay? And <clears throat> these causes include, let me just go one, one by one. The, uh, as far as the stroke causes, the heart is one of the leading causes of stroke. Uh, somebody having an abnormal rhythm in the heart or they have been... Um, uh, irregularly functioning heart or they have had a myocardial infarction in the past, they are part of their heart muscles are not functioning well, which leads to stagnation of blood in that region and that will cause formation of a clot. And these clots can fly into the brain, block a blood vessel and cause an acute stroke. And blood vessel disease per se, so somebody having a narrowing of the blood vessel in the neck, for example, the blood vessel that goes here, most commonly here at the neck, people may have a little narrowing and over a period of time that can progress. Like we, as, we, as we age, we have graying of the hair, the blood vessels inside lining can develop uh, accumulation of fat and they can progressively narrow and which is, which is not picked up by regular screening or which is not taken care of, then they develop in stroke or there may be atherosclerotic changes within the brain. Those blood vessels become narrow over a period of time that can cause a stroke. <clears throat> Apart from this, the other causes uh, that can generally cause stroke are uncontrolled diabetes. We need to understand that diabetes accelerates atherosclerotic disease or accelerates blockage of the blood vessel. Uncontrolled blood pressure can also cause accumulation of fat and over a period of time, the blood vessels become more and more thicker and they can lead to stroke. And there are some people who are genetically prone, who have hypercholesterolemia, familial hypercholesterolemia. They have high incidence of developing stroke as well. And in those people, the strokes run in families. So all these things have to be understood, taken care of. And apart from this, some people also have genetically determined procoagulant effects on the blood. The blood is more thicker for them. Blood can become uh, more, more, more solid easily. And people who smoke, they tend to clot the 
uh, blood quite easily and their hemoglobin level generally are a little higher than the normal people and they tend to form clots much more easier. So these are the common causes of stroke. And when once we understand all this and take care of this, for the most part, we can prevent a stroke. One little fact that people need to understand is that about 80% of the strokes that happen today can be prevented by appropriate preventive measures. So prevention is better than cure. In stroke, that is extremely important. And awareness of public is extremely important for this prevention. And people have to be taught about what are the causes of stroke. And if suppose someone develops a kid or kin develops a stroke, they need to understand how to pick up a stroke, how to easily identify it. For, some, for example, somebody develops a heart attack, they need to do an EEG, they need uh, complex measures to understand that somebody has developed a stroke. Whereas, uh, I mean, uh, developed a heart attack, I'm sorry. If somebody has developed a stroke, it's much easier. You just ask them to do certain things. You tell them something, see if they understand what you say. You ask them to reply. If they are able to reply to you properly, then they are good. Ask them to lift both their hands. If their arm is drifting or if they are not able to lift their arm, then it's a sign of stroke. Ask them to <clears throat> stand steadily. If they are not able to maintain their balance, that again is a sign of stroke. And ask them if their vision is affected on one side or the other side, that's also a sign of stroke. So these are very simple measures. If we create a good public awareness and people are able to pick this up, at the early stage, they can come to us much faster and we will be able to treat them more effectively. Whereas we don't need very complex stuff to pick up stroke and bring them to the hospital. The earlier they come, we will be able to treat them more effectively in the hospital. As far as the ischemic stroke, which is the majority of the stroke, I'm just going to reiterate certain factors and go a little deeper into that with regards to the complex uh, treatment of ischemic stroke. Ischemic stroke, as I told you, is a lack of blood supply or uh, uh, blood flow to the brain is abruptly uh, stopped, then that part of the brain doesn't work well and they develop weakness of the hand and leg on the other side. If it is affects the left hemisphere, they may uh, not be able to understand and speak as well. But this happens within minutes. But within minutes, how are we to treat? We will not be able to treat them. But luckily for us, nature has given us what is called collateral supply. If, for example, one blood vessel is affected, there are other blood vessels coming from the back or coming from the other side, which can preserve this brain for quite some time. You understand? So if it can preserve the brain for quite some time, it gives us the window during which we can treat those stroke. That window period is extremely important. I'm going to talk about those window period a little bit in detail as we go along. Okay. And if somebody has developed a stroke, you want to bring them to the hospital. Where will you take them? You need to take them right to a hospital, which is a comprehensive stroke center, which has all the facilities. That is extremely important. For example, somebody develops a stroke, they go to a smaller nursing home, and then they are sent to a scan center. By the time the scan is done, comes back, a lot of time is wasted. Whereas a comprehensive stroke center has a scan inside, and within about 5 to 10 minutes, the scan is done, and we are able to interpret the scan and start the treatment right away. Every minute counts because after a large vessel occlusion, if the patient's treatment is delayed, for every minute that is delayed, about 1.2 million neurons are lost. So they, their brain ages much, much, much faster. So we need to treat them acutely, effectively, and in a very quick time. For that, they need to get to what is called a comprehensive stroke center. And what are the modern treatments available? If somebody is coming to the hospital after a stroke, and the family is able to pick it up and bring them to the hospital within first say three to four and a half hours of window and we are able to make a diagnosis. We treat them first with what is called thrombolytic medications. We have variety of thrombolytic medications. They are medicines which will lyse and break the clot and allow the blood to flow normally. So those are uh, medicines we have today and we can administer those medicines for people up to four and a half hours from the time of onset of stroke. If they come beyond that period or within that period, but it's a large vessel occlusion, we give the thrombolytic medication, they don't improve immediately. <clears throat> then we go to the next step. What is the next step that is available? It is called endovascular treatment of stroke. Endovascular thrombectomy, we call it. What we do is that this is a very complex term, but you don't need to uh, uh, break your head with that. What we do is there is a block. We need to remove the block, restore the blood supply. So endovascular means going inside the blood vessel, removing the clot, allowing the blood to flow into the brain is what we achieve by this. And today we have evidence 
that for somebody developing a stroke, up to 24 hours, we can do this procedure and we can make them better. It's not that, oh, there is 24 hours, you can come later. No, earlier they come, the better the outcome is. Up to 24 hours, in certain population of people, we will be able to help, not everybody. For everybody who comes within the first four and a half hours, up to six hours, we provide this mechanical thrombectomy. <clears throat> After we analyze them with the CT, CT angiogram, identifying where the clot is, and then we take them immediately to the cath lab, and then we do the procedure. As far as this procedure is concerned, what we do is that we access to the blood vessel of the patient by going through the groin blood vessel. Okay, And we put small little plastic tubes called catheters. We put it up using x-ray control. We guide the catheter up all the way up to the neck. We inject dye to see where the block is. And after we identify the block, we have various techniques to remove the clot. One, we call it as a stent reward. We have a stent, which is a self-expanding stent. You might have heard everybody putting stents for the heart. It is actually a metal scaffold, which we put across the clot and we grab the clot and pull it out using suction uh, techniques to open up the blood vessel. There is also another technique where we put a little larger bow catheter all the way up into the clot and we aspirate it. We aspirate it, we suck the clot out and remove it. In today's world, with my experience, <clears throat> uh, in most centers where we do these procedures regularly, we can open up these blood vessels in about say 90 to 95% of the patients successfully. But will everyone improve so well? Not all. About say 60 to 65% of the patients will improve to a good functional level. Even the remaining, say 30 to 35% of the patients will get to a better modified Rankin scale. I told you earlier, modified Rankin scale is a score to assess their disability. We put them from a score of say three to two or three to one. They are still more functional. They are not dependent on others. They, are, they can do their own activities. They are much better than without this kind of a treatment. And then people talk about, oh, this treatment is new treatment, this treatment is costly. Uh, no, that's not the case. See, approximately in today's world, doing this procedure uh, would, would cost about, say, three to five lakhs. But taking care of a disabled patient every month, even in a smaller setup, will cost about one to two lakhs. If you look at the larger picture, the cost is, in fact, it's more cost effective. So people have to understand that this is an effective treatment and it is a cost effective when you look at the longer run for a stroke patient and it is an effective treatment that we can offer these patients if they come on time. People have to be aware that strokes can be picked up without any advanced technology. They need to just come to the hospital. Once they are here, we have a system in place. We have a protocol in place that the patient is analyzed immediately by the ER physician, the neurologist, neurosurgeons, neurointervention team, and we are able to offer this treatment in a very, very quick time to make them better. And um, as far as the uh, stroke for 24 hours, I just spoke about treating everybody up to six hours uh, to eight hours with, with mechanical thrombectomy. There, there is enough evidence in the last two, three years that we are able to treat certain patients for up to 24 hours. Who are these subset of patients? These subset of patients are the people who have good collaterals. As I told you, uh, we, we thrive on the alternate blood supply that comes to the affected area. When, uh, once a blood vessel is affected, what happens is you have a, a stroke, a part of the brain is permanently damaged, around which we have a penumbra. Penumbra is a region where there is minimal blood supply, but the brain is still surviving. So we identify these people by using advanced technology. Advanced technology, it's called a perfusion scan, either a CT perfusion or MR perfusion scan. And based on the findings of this perfusion scan, we make a decision on identifying the patients who will benefit. As time passes on beyond, say, eight hours to 24 hours, the number of people that get benefited by these perfusion or <clears throat> by these procedure will come down. So the earlier you come, more people will get benefited and the effect would be much better in terms of the outcome. So I would urge people to understand that stroke is a treatable disease in today's world, but time is essence, time is brain. The more time is lost, more brain is lost. You need to come to the hospital in quick time so that we will be able to analyze using advanced technology and we will be able to offer better treatment so that the outcome is much better and the patient goes home walking. That is the dream of every, every treating physician for a stroke patient today walking into the hospital, which is unlike the years in the past, about eight, 10 years back, I would not have imagined this, but today it's a reality. 
absolutely. Thank you, Doctor. We'll just now take a few questions uh, from our viewers. Uh, what are the guidelines uh, for somebody to get thrombolytic therapy in stroke? Yeah, uh, thrombolytic therapy is usually the therapy which is offered within the first three to four and a half hour, uh, four and a half hours of onset of stroke. So, as far as the guidelines is concerned, we need to be very clear on when the patient was last seen normal. Normally, the onset of stroke, we take it as a time. They were seen by somebody as a normal person walking and talking. For example, somebody comes early in the morning. Okay, when they woke up, they woke up with a stroke. But he was seen last night, say around 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Somebody saw him just walk to the bed and like uh, he went to the bed and he was all, all fine by about 11 o'clock. Then we take that time as the onset of stroke. And those patients cannot be given thrombolysis. Whereas somebody sitting in the office, then all of a sudden slumping down uh, 10 minutes back uh, his uh, neighbor would have seen like practically that uh, the patient was sitting and working in his chamber he was all fine then we know the onset of stroke was just then and those patients we can offer this treatment then to offer thrombolytic therapy they should not have had any recent surgery because thrombolysis will lyse the clot which can lead to internal bleeding they should not have uh, bleeding diathesis they should not have bleeding tendency and their blood pressure should be fairly under control, even if it is too high when they come with a stroke, we tend to reduce with medicines and then bring it to a certain level, less than 180 of systolic so that we are able to offer these treatments. And uh, thrombolytic therapy is an effective therapy usually for smaller blood vessel occlusions, more distal smaller blood vessel occlusions. The uh, chances of this thrombolytic therapy opening is about say 60 to 70 percent, whereas for large vessel occlusion, the effect of this thrombolytic therapy significantly comes down. It's about say 20 to 30 percent where the mechanical thrombectomy scores over. Right. Uh, what do you think is the most important factor in acute stroke treatment? Yeah, the most important factor, I always reiterate to all my patients and whenever I give talks to the IMAs and other public, I tell them the most important factor is the child. The family and the uh, friends or the relatives should realize that somebody is having a stroke. So to know that somebody is having a stroke, they need to be aware of the symptoms and signs of stroke. That is extremely important. One important thing that people have to understand is that stroke is a painless disease, whereas heart attack is a painful disease. So the pa patient is really suffering. He yells, makes noise, and people are able to scoop him and get him to the hospital. Whereas with stroke, somebody is not able to use the hand. They would just say, okay, I'm just going to bed and lie down for, say, half an hour. I, I, I think it's going to get better. By the time they wake up, the damage is completely done. It's a painless disease. And somebody is not able to use a part of the body, they should realize that they should come to the hospital immediately. So I think time is the most important factor in the treatment of stroke. And the second important factor I would feel is getting them to a comprehensive stroke center where all the treatment scans, the physicians and the team is readily available to, to receive them and treat them is extremely important. And the third is obviously they have this collaterals. Not everybody has good collaterals. If they have good collaterals, we are able to really help them and we can see them walk out of the hospital without, without any disability. Does controlling blood pressure have an impact on the early management of acute stroke? Absolutely correct. So uh, blood pressure is one of the leading causes of somebody developing stroke along with diabetes and hypercholesterolemia. Blood pressure also puts them at a higher risk of developing advanced atherosclerotic disease and the blood vessels become more and more stiffer and thicker. And there is constant accumulation in the inner lining of the blood vessel with these cholesterol plaques that progressively narrow the blood vessel. At some point, it can rupture, leading to an acute stroke. So blood pressure management in the early stages is extremely important to prevent a stroke and, and to have lesser effect even if somebody develops a stroke. Uh, similarly, uh, will managing or is it, is it important to manage uh, the lipid profile as well? Correct. Along uh, the triglycerides. And correct. There are some people who have familial hypercholesterolemia. They are at an increased risk of stroke. Hypercholesterolemia goes hand in hand with diabetes and hypertension. 
and all the three combination puts people at a risk of developing a stroke and managing and identifying these hyperpolystylemia especially the increased triglycerides is extremely important and they should have improved physical activity to improve their hdl that is a good cholesterol level has to be high to prevent and uh, avoid the consequences of stroke what is the role of uh, regular health checks in uh, prevention of acute stroke yeah we should all realize that stroke happening in the brain is not an independent disease practically anybody uh, who has a heart ailment it's 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 a most of the heart ailments like a heart attack is a vascular disease happening in the blood vessels the same blood vessel pattern the patient has for the brain as well so likewise for the heart for the brain as well all the preventive measures for the heart we need to do we need to do it for the brain high uh, controlling the blood pressure controlling the sugars high cholesterols and having a periodic health check so that all these parameters are kept under control their bp is being monitored regularly and they go to a, a nearby physician if their uh, bp is high if they have diabetes to make sure that they are under control because unfortunately like a fever not that taking one pill uh, relieves me of everything practically they can tend to fluctuate over a period of time and they should understand these diseases it's a, it's a lifestyle change that they have to undergo so that their blood pressure sugars are constantly monitored and kept under control and these are the most important preventive measures for stroke as well like we do for the heart do, do patients with acute stroke also experience any swallowing disorders and how do you manage that condition yeah swallowing is is a byproduct of stroke happening in certain parts of the brain practically the most common thing we come across is a speech defect if the left hemisphere is affected obviously they cannot speak but if the posterior circulation there are centers in the brain which control our lower cranial nerves which control the movement of our tongue palate and swallowing as well if that part is affected then they will have significant swallowing difficulty and then there are a good number of people after stroke when they are recovering they may uh, have unconsciousness for some time then they will slowly recover regain consciousness by the time we may have a tracheostomy in place they may have a temporary swallowing difficulty but over a period of time generally they improve in if somebody is affected with a stroke we see the final disposition or how they recover and what is their leftover disability at about say 3 months from the time of onset of stroke they go through a, lo- a, a significant number of phases at that time uh, hospital phase and then after the hospital phase practically it is the uh, in house rehab within the hospital rehabilitation facility then we move them to home care and in the home care they undergo the rehabilitation facility by that time a significant number of them would recover from the swallowing difficulty and the tracheostomy would come out and at 3 months a significant number of them would recover from these swallowing difficulties right So thank you Dr. Srinivasan Parmasivam for this wonderful discussion. It was very in-depth and very illuminating and I'm sure our viewers found it very useful indeed. And viewers thank you for joining in and please do write in your comments, queries uh, to our Facebook page or inbox us or definitely do follow us on our YouTube channel so that you can catch all our trending healthcare topic videos. If you have anything further you can always uh, contact us at any time uh, through our email and other uh, contact uh, means means of contact on our pages so do follow us and do get back to us and see you also next week meanwhile take care and stay safe thank you and namaste thank you dr shrinivy and thank you viewers